review of chapter four. Again, this is for College Physics by John Batista, fifth edition, McGraw-Hill. Uh, just a big idea. Let's just get the really big ideas from the previous chapters as a review of a review. Um, number one, Newton's second law. I'm going to write like this, F net. Mass times acceleration. And then we have the definition of uh, displacement, uh, velocity, and acceleration. Let's just put down the important one. Average velocity is the change in position, which we call displacement with respect to time, delta r, delta t. r is the position. And then the acceleration is the change in velocity with respect to time. Uh, after that, we have some special forces. We have uh, gravity friction, normal force, tension, but that's really the most important thing right there. And so this chapter focuses on what if this is not zero? That's, that's really the whole point right there. Now, with that, we are looking at the motion of objects. Let's say I have a car. It starts right here and it ends up over here and it's accelerating. Okay, so now we have a bunch of things like what's its starting, we know delta, the change in time, going from here to there, but what about where, what's the position, what's the velocity, and all that stuff. So the book uses this notation, x, i, and f. So it will say this in just the uh, x direction, that's x, x, i, x, f, v, x, i, no, is it called i, x? No, it says v, i, x, it doesn't really matter, v, i, x, v, F, X. So this is the I stands for initial, F stands for final. So this is the initial position, the final position. This is the initial X velocity, that's the final X velocity. Now you may see other versions like X1 to X2. You have, can also see X0 to X, that's a common one. So this says like the position one, position two, I kind of like that. Uh, o means at time t equals zero, and this is just your generic time. So that's called, that will be actually be any variable x in the future. I, it's kind of weird. So I don't really see x o to x f. Uh, you could put that. You could put x zero to x one. Whatever notation you use, just make sure that you understand is position at the beginning, position at the final, velocity at the beginning, velocity at the final. Technically, you have a, a initial time and final time. I'm going to try to use the notation from the book John Batista, College Physics 5th edition. But if I make a mistake, I make a mistake. So I'm not going to derive these in this summary, but it's not impossible to derive. Because if, let's say I, I'm going to give you a, a brief derivation. Let's call this the x direction. So v average x is the change in x with respect to time. But the velocity is changing too because of over here, ax is delta vx delta t. If you combine these two together, you get the following very popular equation. I'm going to write it like the book writes it. Delta x equals, that's kind of, okay. I'm trying to write it just like they do. Vix delta t plus one half ax delta t squared. I like the delta t's in here. I Normally I would write this as x final equals x initial plus v i x delta t plus one half a x, that's a, a sub x, that's the acceleration the x direction, delta t squared. I like that better. I like to put it that way. But it's the same thing, right? Because if I say delta x is x final minus x initial, then I just add that x initial to both sides. I get this equation right there. Okay, and so a lot of times you'll see this is just t, not delta t. Um, if t initial equals zero, then delta t is just t. And I mean, this is the best way to do it. This is the more correct way to do it. So this is one of the kinematic equations right there. Notice that that gives a change in position based on time, and it does have a t squared. And this is the acceleration in the x direction. Now, you can just use this right here and get the following equation. They write it as delta v. I'm going to write it as just v initial, um, v final x is v initial x plus 
AX delta T. Because if I write VX final minus VX initial for here, and I multiply both sides by delta T and then add VIX, I get that equation. And this is one of the equations. And these work for X and Y, it doesn't really matter. Um, the, and the next equation, they have one, I'm not even gonna write that one. Uh, really, there's just the three most important ones. And this is the next one it says, V initial X, no, that's not what that says. Yeah, final. V final X squared equals V initial X squared plus two, they wrote it a little bit different, that's fine. Two AX delta X. This one is really nice because it does not have time in it. So generally for all these problems, what you wanna do is to say, okay, what don't I know and pick the equation that, that doesn't have the thing you don't know. This one doesn't have final velocity. Uh, this one doesn't have change in position and this one doesn't have time. And so then you can use that to kind of eliminate which one you wanna to use to solve for. And, and these are all derivable, it's not even that hard. Um, I, have, I have done a video on it, I'll probably do another one because it's, it's, not, it's not too terribly difficult. Okay. Now, the other big thing, there's two other big things. Well, one's not that big of a thing. Um, projectile motion. This one can get a little tricky, but it's not that hard. So suppose I have some object that starts with an initial velocity V initial vector. And it starts with an initial position, R initial. So it has an initial X position and an initial Y position. Once it's in the air, the only force acting on it is the downward gravitational force, mg. So if we write Newton's second law, F net in two equations, F net X is gonna be equal to zero. There's no force in the X direction. So that means that, uh, it's not equal to, that means AX, equals zero. The acceleration in the x direction is zero. F net y is equal to negative mg equals may. So ay is negative g. So just a quick note here, there's two things. There's the vector g, which is equal to zero, negative 9.8, zero, newtons per kilogram or meters per second squared same thing and then when we write g that's actually the magnitude of that vector so it's 9.8 uh, newtons per kilogram so the acceleration is negative g we have to put that negative on there just to be clear if i have this motion and the acceleration the vertical direction is negative g and there's no horizontal direction it turns out that the X and the Y motions are independent of each other except for time. So it's gonna move down here and land at some final position, R final. And so I can write the following, they have the same time, right? In the horizontal motion, I have an object moving at a constant speed. In the vertical motion, I have a constant acceleration. So this is the important thing. In the X direction, I can write X final equals X initial plus v x i x delta t and there's no acceleration because the acceleration is zero i can also write uh, really that's the only equation that's important in the y motion i have this y final equals y initial plus v initial y delta t minus one half g delta t squared Right, so that's the acceleration is negative g. That's why I have that minus sign. Typically, what you'll do is use this solve for time. Not always, but and then plug that in over there and solve for what you don't know. Okay, because they're independent motions. Now there is another thing. If I have this launched at some angle with some angle theta, and I'm given the magnitude of the velocity, then let's draw a picture. Here's V I initial theta, I want the X and the Y components. So V I X is gonna be V I cosine theta. V I Y is V I sine theta.
right? Just using the right triangle rules for that triangle right there. They have a thing in, in the chapter about terminal velocity, which I think is pretty cool, um, but they never talk about the actual calculation of it. I'll probably do some uh, terminal velocity stuff in class just because I like it, uh, but I'm just giving a chapter summary here. Now, there is one other thing that's a little weird, um, and let's just say it real quick. Suppose that you have a person standing on flat ground and not accelerating. Uh, then they have a downward gravitational force, mg, and then the normal force from the ground. That's the forces on the person. Those two add up to zero vector, and they're at rest. It turns out that n is what we call the apparent weight. So suppose you get in an elevator, and you may have been in an elevator at some point, and the elevator is accelerating upwards. Well, that means that you are also accelerating upwards, so you have a downwards gravitational force, mg, and you have to have an upward normal force, n, I've drawn it exaggerately, exaggerately large. That's the only way that that can work, right? And so what happens, notice that this depends on the earth and you, earth and you, neither of which change in these situations but you feel heavier. If you push that up button and you start accelerating, you feel heavier. You are not heavier. Your gravitational force is the same. What changed was the normal force. So the normal force is the apparent weight. And there's other ways to explain that, but that's the important thing. So whenever people ask for apparent weight, you would want to calculate the normal force. Uh, the same thing can be true. If this accelerates down, uh, then the normal force could be zero and you'd be weightless. You'd feel weightless, but you're not weightless. And we'll talk about gravity and orbits and space and all that stuff later, uh, but that's that apparent weight uh, thing there. And that's it for chapter four.